Hi. That was some intro. I have to say, thank you, Steffi, for having us here. And thank you guys for staying so late and listening to us. And also, Steffi, thank you for saying Wojtek's last name so I don't have to. Um, <laughs> Wojtek is a friend of mine that I, d I have been dreading the day I was going to have to say his last name. But I, is, I'm going to pronounce it Sochevitsa, right? Really? I did it. Ah, thank you. Um, my name is Brooke, and I don't come from a background of working with the Auschwitz Foundation, but I met Wojtek when I was in Poland this summer, and I had the privilege as a Jewish woman to experience Auschwitz and Birkenau through his lens, and it was a remarkable day. So just to get a sense, how many of you ha have been to Auschwitz-Birkenau? Okay, it's a good amount. How many of you have been to another concentration camp like Dachau? Okay, so you guys know, you've experienced it. It changes you. There was something about it changed my, my thinking, my something in my DNA. And let me preface our talk by saying there is still nothing more important than going there, getting the word out, being there in person, experiencing it, walking through those gates. But sometimes, Life means we can't get there. And with the rise of anti-Semitism, as we're seeing, and Holocaust denying, in the US, we have the artist formerly known as Kanye West doing his best uh, to get that, that message out there. The former president of the United States having dinner with a Holocaust denier. This is not going away. We have been fighting anti-Semitism from the beginning of time, and it is important to continue to do that fight. And we have a lot of work to do. And one of the things that we want to be able to do is experience that, see that. And the foundation for which Wojtek is the CEO of is all about the preservation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, from the buildings to the memories to the items. And now he's working on an unbelievable program that's not without controversy to bring this online. And what that means is for those people, children, students, I mean, we have a statistic that says, according to a recent Axios article, 68% of Americans from the ages of 18 to 40 do not know the name of a concentration camp. Uh, or th yeah, and 48% of Americans did not believe or know that it was 6 million Jews who died. So we have a lot of work to do. And what the foundation is doing now is building an online platform to help those who cannot get to Poland in that moment in time, students and whatnot, to have that experience and have that interaction. So I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about what you're doing, what you're fundraising for, so if anybody's interested to talk to us after, in this program, in this platform that you're getting ready to launch. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Steffi, and thank you to everyone for being here. It is, uh, it is a tough topic. Uh, we know that we have met and it was very emotional uh, back in, in August of last year. Um, for many people, this is a personal story. Uh, we work, um, we have been, the foundation has been established uh, 13 years ago and ever since we've been working with survivors um, uh, who have to consent to everything we do, of course, be it preservation of personal items, be it new technologies, be it media work. So we do everything uh, um, by respecting, of course, their will and their wishes. And it's good that so many still are uh, with us. And uh, we have to be aware that time is passing and there will be a time when there will be no survivors present and they will not be able to teach in schools. They will not be able to meet young generations. And um, um, the foundation, uh, three years ago, we had absolutely no experience when it comes to new technologies, to platforms, because we come from a preservation background. The foundation was established by um, a man by the name of Władysław Bartoszewski, who was Polish, uh, Catholic, and he was an Auschwitz survivor himself. And for him, it was a lifetime mission to save everything that is there. So all, all the authentic remains, uh, glasses, uh, shoes. We have 100,000 shoes of prisoners. Among those, there is 8,000 children's shoes. Um, there is letters, there is clothing, of course, and the whole infrastructure. The most important principle in preservation is that we do not change anything. We are not uh, repairing. We are preserving at the stage of, uh, at the state of 1945, because this is a place of evidence. Whenever someone decides to arrive, to visit, people should have the chance to see how it was in 1945. We don't want to improve anything because this would not be evidence. We would change history. This is not our mission. So when, when COVID hit and uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau is a museum like so many others, we had to go under lockdown. 
And um, the difference to the Louvre or the Centre Pompidou or Tate Gallery, whatever, is that uh, people who, most of them, who come to Auschwitz-Birkenau, they come to, some of them to understand, others to experience, some to mourn family members whom they have lost or families who have survived. Um, so you always need someone who is there with you. And guides who are uh, educated and, and trained in Auschwitz-Birkenau, there is 350 of them who speak in 21 languages and they guide in 21 languages. They are not only there to ter tell the history of Auschwitz-Birkenau, they are also there to take care of us once we decide to arrive and to learn about this horrendous history. So when COVID hit, the museum went under lockdown and we had to come up with something because people from all over the world said, listen, we do understand this is a museum, you have to be under lockdown, but this place, like no other in the world, has to remain accessible. People want to come, they want to experience, and you have to do something. We had no experience. As I said, we, we come from, from the preservation background, but we were reached out by two wonderful Israeli companies. One is Apps Flyer, the other Diskin. Diskin is a creative agency, and we partnered two and a half years ago, and ever since we started developing this platform for remote guided visits, which will be based on um, interactive contact with human beings on the other end. So let's say if any of you decided to have a uh, remote guided visit because you can't go to Poland, it's Oświęcim, it's a small village in the south of Poland, you have no time, you don't have the financial means, but you would like to experience, you would like to see and understand perhaps. Um, you would then uh, book a tour, let's say Friday at uh, seven o'clock in 45 minutes, and you will connect with a living guide on the other end, who through their mobile devices will be guiding you in one hour and 45 minutes on the site of Auschwitz-Birkenau, explaining the history, explaining the fate of, of the prisoners, of the victims, of the survivors, and trying to bring a little bit closer the realities, which we, from our perspective, can't understand. And if I may, the guides are, as he, he said, they are so trained. I mean, they are not only trained in the history and all the details, but they have mental health training. They have, there's a lot of support there for, they need it themselves for what they experience on a daily basis, but also to be a support for those people, whether in person or online, to be a support for them because people, as you can imagine, and as you have experienced, have reactions. So there, it's, an, it's, it's way more than what we consider a guide, you know? It's not just a walking, it's, it's this person who is, you're entrusting themselves. They're entrusting you and vice versa on that experience. In many, in many uh, cases, uh, people who arrive, I remember I was just guiding uh, one of the uh, ambassadors who were based in Warsaw. He arrived with a private visit with his family, wife and two sons, both of them being teenagers, and they were, they were very smart, uh, smart boys. They knew a lot about history. They knew where they were coming to. And as we were walking and um, a guide was explaining uh, the place, I realized that there were certain spots which they identified from social media. So they were saying like uh, the, uh, the gate with the inscription Arbeit macht frei, they were saying, oh, I know this from TikTok. Then we were passing by the selection ramp and they were saying, we know this from Instagram. So this also, um, makes us understand that there is uh, social media, new technologies are the thing to communicate this terrible history with new generations. Otherwise, we will lose them. So we know now with this very difficult experience that this is, uh, this is a place for us to be, to explore with all the respect we have to pay and with all uh, the opinions we have to consider. In every case, it's an ethical decision. And I will say, as somebody who also writes a pop culture newsletter, we do cover, there's been a few influencers over the years who make mistakes and do TikToks, as he referenced. Uh, it's one thing to just do a TikTok if somebody wants to show their community what they're seeing, but there's another when the influencers are doing like a dance in front of the gate of Auschwitz-Birkenau. It happens, believe it or not. We've seen it and I've written about it. Um, so it's a way to educate as well so people understand the seriousness and that, that respect, which we all must have. And the controversy is there are people, there are people here today who believe that Auschwitz is meant to be experienced in person only, and that then you keep that experience quiet out of respect for the survivors. And that's one point of view. I, you know, I believe that is expanding the view, world view of people who can't get there is important, but also this is done all with survivors endorsements and and desire is that right yeah 
Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. And we also see the platform uh, will be operational in, in very few months. Um, we are right now at producing stage three, the final uh, stage of the uh, software development. We are training guides right now to be camera operators, uh, to, to walk on site with a, with a mobile device. We have partnered with uh, Orange, the mobile um, provider, to establish a secure and, and, uh, and stable internet network on site. Auschwitz Birkenau is 200 hectares large, so you really need a, uh, uh, a stable internet network. Uh, I think we have a, a little clip. Can we get that yeah. one minute clip played? Be be before you play it, let me just uh, oh. explain what you're going to see is um, this is how the platform will look. But it's quite the, con the contrary of what you will experience if you decide to have an online tour because this is pre-recorded. For demonstration purposes, we have to pre-record what, what you will experience if you decide to make this tour. It will be live, so interactive. You will be able to ask questions, to react to the content once, uh, once explained by the guide. And in America, I don't know how many of you know, many public schools are not teaching the Holocaust, or if they are, they're teaching the other side of the Holocaust, which I don't know what other side there is. Um, so imagine as a family, if you want your children to know this is something they can't get to Poland, this is gonna be an incredible resource. So if we could show it. Hello, my name is Tavus Savitsky and today I'll be your guide during the online visits at the Auschwitz Memorial. You'll be able to see two parts of the former German Nazi camp, Auschwitz I and Auschwitz II Birkenau. So, let's begin. In front of you, you can see the gate Arbeit macht frei. Work makes one free. This is the entrance to the Auschwitz I camp. The inscription was a very cynical slogan that was used by the perpetrators and some survivors from the first transport say that when they arrived here and they look at the complex of buildings and they, they saw the sign, uh, they thought it would be maybe some kind of a slave labor camp and if they work well, everything will be fine. When they crossed the electrified barbed wire that you can see in front of you, they learned very quickly that nothing is going to be okay here. So Auschwitz starts as a concentration camp, but at the turn of 1941 and 1942, Auschwitz becomes an extermination camp as part of the plan of annihilation of European Jews. And later, when we move to Birkenau, you will be able to see the place where the selection happened, and we will talk about the process of extermination. At the entrance gate to the uh, camp, you can see the watchtowers, you can see uh, barbed wire fences, and here, at the kitchen building, there was the camp's orchestra. In the pictures, you can see the uh, members of the orchestra playing, and they usually played in the morning in the evening. And you can also see some scenes in artworks that survivors remembered uh, from this moment of mainly coming back to the camp. That was the uh, most painful moment because they had to follow the rhythm given by the orchestra walking along this road and they carried corpses of people who died during the day and they were beaten if they couldn't do so. So all these horrible scenes uh, took place in the road of the camp that you can see in front of us. So that's interactive, right? Mm -hmm. So I could actually speak to the guide, ask questions. They can point out, this is not a recording. This is not a documentary. Life. And how hard is that to build? It's extremely built and it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's a separate story because it's also very interesting to see that it's possible with new technologies to enter into a authentic historical site with so much pain and so, much, uh, so, much, uh, so many difficult experiences. It's all based on beacons the uh, original materials, the artwork, the music, the footage you saw is, um, uh, is uploaded into beacons which are then placed on site and the guide will have the, uh, uh, the power to control these contents. So whenever he or she will be passing by the orchestra and later by, by blocks or by the segregation ramp, they will make the decision, do I want to share? What would, I like, what, what would I like to show? If there is a discussion, they can show less. If there is no discussion, they can show more materials. So, um, what's age appropriate if you have younger students versus high, like college kids? Yeah. And I know we're, we're short on time, but I, this is the first 
of the technology breakthroughs you guys are doing at the foundation. My understanding is, and this is coming, this is launching in a few months. They're still in fundraising mode. If you guys wanna be involved, please come talk to us. But the next iteration is, I think the natural place where all our minds go, there's AI, there's VR. What's happening there? I think you're in the creative place of a, of a virtual reality experience. Yeah, we have partnered with a wonderful organization from the UK, Atomize Studios, who's very experienced in uh, virtual reality. And we will be using individual experiences of, of uh, prisoners, but also items which are original and preserved by the foundation and memorial to tell the story of the Holocaust from these individual items into the universal story of the Holocaust through a 360 degrees experience. So this is, uh, this has also been endorsed by survivors. They, they, they understand that this needs to happen with young generations and that's, that is going to be the next step. We are right now in the creative process of developing the concept. And it's an important reminder of how technology can be used for a beautiful, preservation of memories in storytelling and um, making sure that we continue to fight this fight of, of Holocaust denying and anti-Semitism that is not going anywhere, it seems, but we need to keep, keep doing it. So thank you, Wojtek. Thank you, thank you all thank for you. having us. Thank you, Steffi, so much. Thank you, Steffi. <laughs>